When you visit Yosemite, the idea of the place seems to loom as large as its towering granite cliffs. You feel the urge to invest Yosemite with meaning, to find an idea that makes sense of the profound scenery. Like many Angelinos, I relish my annual trip to Yosemite as a time to leave the city behind for a while and recharge among the black oak, monolithic granite, and tumbling waterfalls. And yet, I'm also aware of the irony, given just how urban Yosemite Valley can feel when crowds swarm in. When the federal government first set it aside as a park in 1864, Yosemite represented a radical idea, the preservation of American wilderness a diorama of primitive America protected for the benefit of future generations. Is this the right way to think about the park? Yosemite's founding principle has been challenged over the years, from the artifice of the firefall to the park service's clash with hippies in 1970, and to the erasure of its native inhabitants from the park's very origins. Could there be a more authentic way to experience Yosemite? And who gets to decide what's authentic? LA is an idea as much as a city, a set of hopes and beliefs that inspired millions to move here. But behind the idea of LA are the stories of people, dreamers who realized their vision for Southern California and others who failed. So let's look back and uncover some clues to a forgotten past in the archives. Lost L.A. explores the untold history behind the fantasy of California. I stumbled upon these postcards in the USC Library's special collections. Here, in one photo album, is a catalog of the way artists and writers, and even the National Park Service, have trained us to see Yosemite. Carefully framed views of the park's monumental scenery, which visitors can replicate from roadside vista points and paved foot trails. It made me wonder, how did Yosemite become a tourist attraction, a sort of natural theme park where scenery is a thing to be consumed, a list of natural attractions to check off? These postcards tell a tidy story about Yosemite, Maybe a little too tidy. I went to see a steward of the land, someone who spends a lot of time thinking about these things, Yosemite Ranger Shelton Johnson. Shelton first made his name as a scholar, uncovering in the archives the once forgotten history of the Buffalo Soldier as an early guardian of Yosemite National Park. But he's become famous as an eloquent ambassador for our parks, and I wanted his take on a question that had been troubling me. It's almost impossible to have a, you know, an unfiltered experience of Yosemite. There are all these cultural images that are just packed into our head. Yeah. But, but how, how can we try to have an authentic, you know, communion with, with what's here, with well, what actually exists? Actually, I, I see people every day that are having a completely authentic experience of Yosemite Valley every single day. They're usually around two years old, three, maybe four or five. When we're kids, we have that unfiltered bias. I mean, we, we just are open to the world. There's no adult faculty to say, well, is this something that we really need to know? Is this important? Is this minor? That's not there. That hasn't developed yet. Mm -hmm. So kids are natural, biological, perceptual sponges that soak in the universe fully. No, filter no filtering is going on. And so every kid implicitly is John Muir. John Muir didn't arrive in Yosemite in 1868 without some cultural baggage of his own. He was a committed romantic. Trained by the arts and literature of his day, Muir sought the sublime in Yosemite, a communion there with God and God's nature. And through his writings, John Muir encouraged us all to see Yosemite's nature in that way and protect it as something sacred. But Muir didn't just engage with Yosemite intellectually, he also experienced it kinetically, testing the limits of his body and his luck as he scaled the park's cliffs and surmounted its highest peaks. I wanted to better understand this John Muir. So I visited a man who has embodied Muir on the stage and on the screen for more than 35 years. I'm so excited to talk to you because I actually saw your show um, might be about 10 or nine, nine or 10 years ago in Yosemite Valley in the theater. And I was just sort of blown away. I mean, you really inhabit that John Muir character and it's clear that you've done just, I mean, tons of research and homework. I, I feel like an important part of John Muir's relationship 
with Yosemite or just the mountains in general, it wasn't just uh, it wasn't just spiritual. It wasn't just sensory. It was it was physical. Like he he wanted to experience it with every fiber of his being. The wilder the the circumstances, the more inclined he was to go and engage it. Uh, they loved storms. He thought they were the most interesting aspect of engaging the wilderness. He just really wanted to get himself um, immersed in it. He was sort of like yeah. an, an extreme athlete of his time. He, in many ways, yeah. Yeah, yeah. As soon as he got out into, into the wilderness, uh, he became instantaneously um, sort of uh, uh, rejuvenated by it and, and enthused by its messages, which were for him uh, as, as grounding as anything he had ever had for religious upbringing. Mm -hmm. So how has the preservation of Yosemite, I guess, changed since when Muir first set, set foot there? Muir's excitement of, uh, of uh, preserving land for its own sake was something that was fairly new in, in the consciousness of Americana. So, and it was that that, that, uh, that uh, inspired Roosevelt to help out in many ways. Uh, it was Roosevelt, for example, that eventually uh, brought the, the Yosemite Valley and uh, the Mariposa Grove of Big Trees back into the national park system, uh, largely through Muir's urging. Nature is forever building up and pulling down and creating and destroying and keeping everything whirling and flowing, chasing everything out of one beautiful form. As age comes on, one source of enjoyment after another is closed. But nature's sources, Yosemite sources, will never fail you. For if enough of us go and play among the spirits of the wilderness, jumping from rock to rock, then we need not despair. For what we so learn to love will be as purely a work of loving creation as are these mountains, these pine trees, my bonny loving flowers. All of us who followed John Muir into the backcountry owe a huge debt to the man, not only for teaching us to experience the place with our bodies, but also for inspiring a preservation movement that culminated in 1964 with the Wilderness Act, setting aside tracts of land that are, to quote the landmark legislation, untrammeled by man, where man himself is a visitor who does not remain. But Muir and the Wilderness Act had a blind spot. He couldn't see how native people had tended Yosemite's nature for thousands of years. He dismissed their role in creating the Yosemite landscape he so admired. And Muir was hardly alone in his thinking. For a long time, the park didn't make room for native people in the stories it told about itself. That cultural shift in perception is extremely important for Americans who are not native people, who do not come from an indigenous culture, to hear because they hold the answers to the questions we're continuing to ask about how do we live in this world and make it sustainable. The native people made this environment sustainable for 8,000 years. So far, so good. So they're the people all over the world. It's indigenous cultures we need to talk to about how do we live hand, hand to mouth? How do we live side by side with wild animals and wild places and not take so much from it that we lose a sense of who we are in the first place? When white settlers first encountered Yosemite in the 1850s, the valley was home to the Awanichi people. And for them, the origins of the park were anything but romantic. The Awanichi was a diverse tribe. There was Miwok, Pai, Chukchansi, or people that actually were trying to escape uh, what was happening on the coast from the missionaries and stuff, coming in and looking for a safe place. Basically, they found Yosemite. But the California gold rush of 1849 would change everything. With it came the miners, who formed the militia, who burned the natives' villages, chased them into the mountains, and away from their homes. They come in here uh, fighting uh, our Indian people here, our native people, and so they, uh, they had to run and hide. They said that we, they ran all the Indians out of Yosemite, and that's not true. They hid in the caves so far that the, the soldiers and the buffalo soldiers couldn't get to them. Uh, but they, they did kill, kill a lot of our native people and elders and, and kids and stuff and, and burnt down all the houses. Those who remained settled in other parts of the valley. 
and their home eventually became a state park, and then a national park, visited by the rest of the world. And in 1931, they were moved to an area where an ancient settlement called Wahoga had once been. The Park Service, along with, uh, I guess, the Indian uh, office, uh, got together and, and uh, built, uh, well, some modern homes for, for the, our tribe at that time. And the place they built uh, the new uh, houses for us was, was right here at uh, Wahoga. We kind of more or less had the village in the, in the uh, valley to ourselves. When we moved down here, they had a more solid uh, roof over their head, shall we say. But their days in Wahoga were numbered. By the late 1960s, unless they worked for the park, they were forced from the valley once again, and their homes destroyed. 1977, Jay Johnson and myself uh, proposed to the National Park Service that we wanted the, the, our village back. That went on until 1980. Uh, a new Secretary of the Interior was, was in place, and the, the new Secretary approved the Yosemite Master Plan in 1980, and that included our or get in the village. So that was, that was big news for us. For a long time, the park remembered its native people through place names like Tenaya Lake or the Awani Hotel as ghosts on a map. But the Awani Chi never left. When the Wawona Tunnel, a triumph of modern engineering, opened in 1933, their descendants were there to celebrate. This photograph, and a similar photograph taken at a reunion many decades later are powerful reminders that Native people still watch over the land in the modern age of tunnels, television, and smartphones. Now, after many years of negotiation, a new village is under construction to keep the ancient traditions alive. I know the tradition couldn't be lost anymore. We've got to bring our kids back to this. You know, we've got to let them know where our foundation is. Our dream is to uh, bring the youth in here and they'll be able to stay in those umachas maybe three to five days. Hopefully they will be able to uh, show them the experience that our ancestors had in living in those. That's, that's, where they that's how they lived. Uh, this is a uh, result of our presence being in Yosemite. Uh, we always say that we never left and we're, and, and we're still here. The park's decision to welcome its native people back to their ancestral home and write them back into its history shows that it's willing to rethink some of its practices. It's not the first time the park has reversed the mistakes of its past. Yosemite, it once seemed, would do anything to encourage visitors. It staged public bear feedings. It allowed campers to drive onto the fragile valley meadows. And for nearly a century, amid so much natural splendor, it staged a wildly popular, thoroughly artificial spectacle, the Firefall. Which brings me back to those postcards I was so interested in. I met up with Ranger Scott Gediman to find the location where my Firefall postcard photo was taken. Well, as a kid growing up in Los Angeles, we would come out here to Stoneman Meadow and we stayed in housekeeping camp. And I just remember that we had the classic station wagon with the, with the wood paneling and we had a big pad in the back and we would come out here to Stoneman Meadow. We'd put the pad out in the meadow and we'd look up at the firefall. And I was six when they stopped, but I vividly remember watching the firefall and I thought it was the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. So describe it for me, what did it look like? And, and when, when did it go off? It went off after sunset, I think. Yeah, yeah. What, it was a tradition. Um, we're looking over at Curry Village, the historic village that um, they started receiving guests in 1899. Mm -hmm. It started as a, as a camp. And so the way it actually happened was up on the top of Glacier Point, they would have a campfire and they would have the campfire all day and they only used red fir bark. And so the fire would go all day and they would get the embers. And so every night at nine o'clock, there was a special ceremony that people would gather here in Yosemite Valley 
and they would play the Indian love song. This was entertainment for visitors, and someone would be up on the top with a big shovel, and they'd shovel over the embers right up there at Glacier Point, and it literally looked like a waterfall of fire, and it would just come down with the embers as an orange line and just go right into the trees. How, f how far down did it go? It went all the way to the bottom. We're here at 4,000 feet. Yeah. We're looking at Glacier Point, a little over 7,000 feet. So we've got a 3,000 foot drop. And so when you would see the embers go down, it was very reminiscent of Yosemite Fall, Upper Yosemite Fall, which is a, a long column. Uh -huh. and, it, and, and I just have these vivid memories of watching the fire fall. And it was something that was done every night in the summer. This image was reproduced, what, hundreds of thousands of times, right? And, and it still is, yes. And, and what you're seeing from this image is not only the firefall at Glacier Point, but also the, the famous Camp Curry sign. Yeah. The Camp Curry, um, that sign is still there. I've seen it. And, yeah. uh, and it, looks, it looks the same today. Sure, sure. Looks like it's a very similar vantage point here. It is. If we look right up at Glacier Point, we can see that as it comes down, face to Glacier Point over the ledge trail and right into Curry Village. So. Just about the exact angle where we're at right now. Yeah, amazing. Uh, so Scott, you grew up in LA, is that right? Correct. Yeah, what part of LA? In North Hollywood. Okay, and what was it like uh, as a kid driving from LA and, and seeing Yosemite? It was literally my dream and my goal since I can remember to become a park ranger in Yosemite National Park. Oh, congratulations, well, you did thank it. You. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> this is back in 1968 and this is up at Glacier Point. And that's me and my brother, Steve, who still lives in Los Angeles uh -huh. with a ranger. And then fast forward 40 years later, and here I am with my son and my daughter um, at the same tree. I love it. And just very excited. So it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very cool. It's Yosemite's in the bloodline. Now. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah. The firefall ended because every time they engaged in that activity, and push those burning red fir embers off of Glacier Point. Mm -hmm. Those burning embers scald, they literally scorched mm. the cliff walls on the way down. And then the people in the, in the meadows below were all looking up to take in the sight. Yeah. They're all trampling on me right. meadows, wet meadows, right. wildflowers. They're literally trampling the beauty they came to see. But their vision was focused up. Their vision was not focused below. So all of those things added up to the superintendent of that time saying that that was an activity that was no, no longer in concert with national, national park philosophy in terms of land management. So it was ended. With the end of the firefall in 1968, that same meadow would soon be the site of an incident that would change park management forever. My mom worked at 20th Century Fox in the music department from 1945 to 1988. So I was on a soundstage before I could walk, really. So I kind of grew up as a Hollywood kid. And so from that, I started working on documentaries, and I came up to Yosemite over Spring Bank in 1970. I found all these people wandering around in this meadow, and there were people from both sides of the generation gap talking to one another, and I thought it would be really great to make a movie about Yosemite as the healing power of nature. Because this place is so awesome and so overwhelming that you can kind of get past your own prejudices. That's so I came back in 4th of July with a crew of three, and we made a 22-minute sync sound film <laughs> with a budget of $1,300. And, uh, and of course, I should say that on the second day of shooting, they had a riot in this meadow. <laughs> ran over someone. There are people who are hurt. A lot of people are hurt, knocked down. It's now a wholesale riot. There were frames from the film that made the New York Times and the Washington Post. And the footage, because we were the only crew here, um, the footage made the CBS Evening News. 1970 was a time when most young people were sort of part of the youth movement. Of course, the ranger cars would go by and the young people standing on the sides were going, boo! There's a cop car with all the windows bashed out of it and we assembled in front of the rangers and uh, we had county sheriffs and all of their deputies. So many law enforcement people just 
crashed in on Yosemite Valley and we're all standing by ready for something. After several days of pleading with the revelers to respect the park's rules, the rangers held a sit-down meeting to discuss the growing conflict. But it boils down to the fact that the national parks are supposed to be, and are, in fact, vignettes or fragments of primitive America. Mm -hmm. National parks are not set aside to be big, rustic fun farms. A number of young people embrace this meadow, treating it pretty much as you would expect to treat Golden Gate Park. Uh, motorcycles are being ridden across this. People were trampling it down into dust. And I think that's part of what shocked the National Park Service at the time. I think it was a complete lack of understanding about how to police a large crowd. Yeah. Uh, essentially, they, they used a loudspeaker and they said the meadow will be closed at 7 o'clock. And if, if it's not closed, it, the assembly will be declared illegal. And at 7.15, they came out of these trees with like 12 or 14 horses and just stampeded the meadow and ran over a bunch of people and hit a bunch of people on the head with axe handles. Right, you had hair back to your, down to Dean, your, your butt crack, <laughs> and Dean had a beard right. down to about here. <laughs> he, he drove a Norton motorcycle and the wind would blow the, <laughs> the, 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 the beard into two halves. He looked like Yosemite Sam, you know. His... People thought I was Orthodox Jew. <laughs> so uh, the director of the National Park Service saw the movie. He's a guy called George Hartzog, and he, he basically said to me after seeing the film, you seem to know what's going on here better than anybody on my staff. They don't know how to talk to these kids. Would you like to come up here and do an evening program for the, the kids that we can't seem to reach? And so Dean came on board and Bob came on board and we did a program seven nights a week from basically Memorial Day to Labor Day for three summers in a row. After the riots, I came back to work as a firefighter the next year. And I had heard that there was somebody doing a hippie show in Yosemite Valley. And so I came down to find out what it was all about. I heard Joni Mitchell and, and Van Morrison tunes wafing through the forest and came around a bend and there was a, a wide movie screen with multiple images and slideshows and one of Dave's fantastic programs going on. And um, that began my career for the National Park Service that I've uh, had the pleasure of enjoying for the last 48 years. All of us who were volunteers and working were in love with the place. And we wanted to introduce our friends to this place that we really love. This place filled a spot in my heart that had been empty. Um, and that changed my life, completely changed my life. Henry David Thoreau said, in wilderness is the preservation of the world. And he's not talking about wilderness as a, as a natural history idea. What he's talking about is the importance of preserving wilderness so that human beings can experience wild, unbridled nature, because that will change them. And so I think that that's, you know, I, I, I guess I'm speaking from my own experience because I came up here at 19 years old and was kind of a wayward kid and you know and I think for Bob and and anybody pretty much anybody with a green and gray uniform on I mean that's that's the gig there's something there's something magical about this valley and and it speaks to people like Bob Roney and Dave Vassar and I and the millions of people you know literally five million people a year who make the long expensive arduous journey to come to places like Yosemite and it's a place that I love and a place that I feel driven to to help protect Yosemite remains a battleground over nature and its management but the powerful beauty of the park continues to inspire and frustrate our attempts to describe it. And you described this as, as something like a cathedral, right? I mean, it's like a very big cathedral. It's, it's at I, once very vast, but it also yeah. is enclosing. Cathedral is trying to put Yosemite on a human dimension. Mm -hmm. It's too big for a cathedral. Mm -hmm. If there were a cathedral this large, you'd never hear the sermon. And it's just on the edge of human comprehension. You can almost take it all in. And there's enough of it that's beyond that realm that we just go, oh, this is amazing.
Looking again at these postcards, I now realize how much was left out of the frame. Dark episodes like the eviction of Yosemite's native people, riots, and traffic jams. I also see how picturesque views like this could provoke struggles over how to manage the land. And when I look at this photo, I now see there's a problem with searching for the one real Yosemite. People have always been part of this landscape. As long as we respect its past and remember its future, the authentic Yosemite experience is the one we create for ourselves. Union Bank is proud to support Lost L.A. Additional funding for Lost L.A. made possible in part by the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation, California State Library, Anne Ray Foundation, and California Humanities.